Okay, when I think back, uh, or when was it, 1991, when I came up with the concept for the Potsdam Institute, yeah. I actually thought this is a nice playing field for a scientist, uh, because you do interdisciplinary science, it's a fascinating topic. I actually thought at that time that 30 years later, the field would just be finished actually, yeah? and the institute could be closed down and I might go back to my old field of foundations of quantum theory and things like that, and it turned out completely different lecture, because our field, you know, climate impacts, climate system science, earth system science, has flourished, of course. Uh, this is now one of the most exciting and, and uh, sort of dynamical fields in all of research across the world, but the problem has also turned out to become bigger and bigger and bigger. And society in the beginning, actually, it's almost paradoxical, in the beginning, society was actually more attentive of climate change and global warming than it is today. I recall very well when in 1988 I was a visiting professor at the University of California and in the spring of 1988 there was this famous Senate hearing in the US where Jim Henson said this is 99% due to anthropogenic global warming. And in that time it's made headlines all over the planet eh? because it was a distant threat, you know. It's a threat where you can play around a little bit. Oh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be terrible uh, if it happened? Today we are in the midst of global warming. I mean, you can see it everywhere. Eh? And because it's so overwhelming, people just try to push it out of their consciousness, so to speak. And this is the problem, actually. We have waited so long to tackle it, but we now seem to be overwhelmed and we declare defeat, actually. And this is, of course, the worst thing that can happen. Because still we can not solve the problem, but we can minimize it to something which we can still manage, of course. Eh? But if we now would find reasons to give up, when it will turn in an outright catastrophe? Yeah? And actually now I know as a scientist, based on the papers we published the last two, three years, but we really face the question whether human civilization can be sustained yeah, over the next centuries. Yeah? And you just, you just said about you know, we're in a position where we can manage the situation, but on the flip side, what you just said, we're questioning whether civilization can be sustained. No. I mean, there's a very yeah, yeah. stark difference. Okay, if we get it wrong, yeah. so if we do the wrong things, policy in economics, in psychology, in science, <coughs> when I think there's a very, very big risk that we will just end our civilization, the human species will survive somehow, but we will destroy almost everything we built up over the last 2,000 years, huh? I'm pretty sure. What sort of time frame would you, would you put on that kind of...? Oh, it can happen pretty soon and pretty quickly, yeah? because you see, if a, a, a minor conflict in Syria is sending so many shockwaves through migrants, for example, to Europe, huh? so it's all about non-linearity. It's the non-linearity stupid. Huh? And this goes in both ways, eh? actually. On the one hand, we can have climate disruptions coming very soon, actually. Eh? But in the medium term, we clearly, if we don't do a lot now, we will send the Greenland ice sheet into irreversible collapse. Eh? And so on. Eh? We can talk about all it. So the nonlinearities are our biggest enemies when it comes to the Earth system. On the other hand, why I'm still optimistic is that in society you also have nonlinear dynamics, eh? tipping points of social, economic, psychological terms. You know, the German feed-in tariff was a tiny little law which was done at the margins eh, of, of, his, of his government, actually, eh? and it instigated a landslide development in renewable energies. Eh? So we are currently writing a paper where we identify eight or ten socioeconomic tipping points, and if we transgress these lines, we can instigate a nonlinear dynamics which will deliver change and reducing emissions within the next 30 years. Right. So you see, 
you have good non-linearities and bad non-linearities. And the question is, if we use our policies and our imagination wisely, the good non-linearities will win. But I, I will talk about the non-linearities also in Cambridge, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I was also going to say, you were going to mention the... Uh, I suppose that, that is the management side. That that's how we overcome this. Yeah, sure. Quite horrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to simply identify a portfolio of options, you know, yes. disruptive innovations or ampli self-amplifying innovations. You cannot predict precisely. Huh? You, you need to look into... Are there high nonlinear potentials uh, in whether it's electric cars, uh, whether it's construction from wood instead of cement and steel, and so on? You can look. And when you have to actually bet on, say, you identified 20 horses and you have to all send them into the race, and maybe three of them will make it across the finishing line, but they will instigate the change you need. Uh, so portfolio is the other thing. And this is very important because the, the conventional economists, they want to be efficient. But efficiency is the enemy of innovation, you know? You have to strand assets. You have to waste capital because you invest into the wrong thing because you cannot know beforehand. But you also invest in the right thing. Eh? So I would say we are somehow trapped in this efficiency thing. Eh? And, and we dig deeper and deeper and deeper. So we have to have the courage yes. to squander money, actually, yeah? to throw money at things that have a potential. Yeah? I think you can win over the pension funds to divest from fossil fuels. That's a no-brainer, more or less. Yeah? You can, the Green Climate Fund will definitely try to pick winners. That means to spend the money wisely. But you know, you have to potentially invest into losers, but also into winners who completely change the game. So it's really venture capital at a global scale we have to master. That is the thing. Eh? So again, we cannot effic efficiently get us out of this predicament. Eh? So we have to save the world, but we have to save it in a muddled way, in a chaotic way, and also in a costly way. That is the bottom line. Eh? If you want to do it in an optimal way, you will fail. Okay. And a moment ago, you, you said it would be crazy to give up. But when news comes out, like it did on the weekend, mm. with, uh, Russia, America, Saudi Arabia, yeah, yeah, sure. This yeah, this a is. A lot of people get very angry and they say, yeah, what's the point? Yeah. I mean, how, what would your. Okay, to that? there are two things. I mean, <clears throat> one thing is. Yeah, I'm aware of this, uh, and I was approached. I will very silently work behind the scenes to maybe influence that uh, through my friends in science and so on. Uh. Let's see what will happen. Uh. We can all do it. But you see, giving up is not an option. Why? I, I just give you an example. I don't know. Do you have children? No, but if you would have a child. Uh, I have a 10 years old boy. And let's assume he has an accident. And the doctor says, OK, we might save his life if we do this type of surgery. Well, there's only a 5% chance. Otherwise, he will die. Would you say, no, we don't do this. We don't go ahead with the surgery. Of course, you will do it. Huh? And so that's the situation we have now. I think we have more than a 5% chance of succeeding, but it's definitely less than 50% in my view. But what's the option? I mean, if we have a finer chance to save our culture and our civilization, I mean, I'm just compelled to do it. Here I can even cite your great prime minister, there is no alternative. <laughs> I do not agree with many other things she said, but here, clearly for the planet, there's no alternative. Eh? And we definitely have a chance which is above zero, as I said. But definitely we have no chance whatsoever if we want to be optimal, you know. Yes. Optimality is the completely wrong paradigm in the situation we are in now.